when you invest with a professional investor like myself or Jay or our colleagues, we know you, we know your name, we know your kids, you know, your pets, your financial situation, et cetera. We can tailor fit our investment portfolio, our opportunities to you, and we can be more transparent with you about why your investment is performing the way that it's performing. If you're a real estate investor and are wondering how to raise and leverage private money to make more profit on every deal, then you're in the right place. On Raising Private Money, we'll speak with new and seasoned investors to dissect their deals and extract the best tips and strategies to help you get the money, because the money comes first. Now here's your host, Jay Connor. Well, hello and welcome to another amazing episode of Raising Private Money. I'm Jay Connor, your host, and this is the podcast where we talk about how to raise private money without ever having to ask for money. Well, my guest today has raised well over a million dollars in private money, and I'm going to be asking him how he goes about it. How does he start conversations? How does he talk with new potential private lenders? And you're going to love his answers to those questions. Well, in his career, and he's very young, he has already helped investors that portfolio spans over 300 apartments that are under renovation and over 500 homes under, uh, under construction across three different markets. In just a moment, you're going to be meeting my guest on today's show. His name is Keshav Kalur, and you're going to meet him right after this. Well, hello there, Keshav. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Jay. Thanks for having me on. It's an honor to be here. Yes, I'm so excited to have you. I mean, uh, you've already raised quite a bit of um, private money. I want us to dive in and talk about how you've gone about raising private money, your, your favorite ways to do it, how you start conversations, and that kind of thing. And then I want us to segue over and talk about uh, your company called Clive Capital, and uh, we'll dive deep in on that as well. So first, let's start with raising private money. It's been my experience, Keshav, that most real estate investors had a pivotal moment or they had something happen in their business that actually pushed them to raising capital. Do you have some kind of story to share as to what it was that did happen in your, uh, in your business or in your investing that actually you said, you know, I need to get out and raise some private money. Yeah, sure thing. So my story is I graduated college in 2019 as a mechanical engineer, got out there and really read Rich Dad Poor Dad on my 15 hour flight to Southeast Asia where I was vacationing for a month to celebrate graduating. And on that flight ride there and back, finished the book, that really got me thinking about investing in real estate and not just relying on my W2 as the sole income source, you know, that I would rely on. And so became a realtor in 2020. And my idea was to go buy single family homes and rent them out. Luckily, before I went too far down that rabbit hole, my roommate here, his dad had invested in syndications and he, my roommate came across a Reddit thread describing syndications. And he sent it to me because he knew I was in real estate. And the author of that Reddit post had invested into 40 homes at the peak of his career. And he said, buying and managing apartment buildings is easier than buying and managing 40 single family homes. And, you know, the returns are projected better tax benefits, diversification, there's a lot of benefits to it. So I thought if there's all these benefits to it and honestly buying apartment buildings sounds a lot cooler than just buying single family homes, why not get into it? Really took the next year from September 2020 to September 2021 to do my due diligence because no one I knew, friends or family had ever really invested into these syndications, except for my friend's dad, I guess. And took that time, became comfortable with the concept 
of syndications and how you can raise private capital from other investors to go out and buy assets like real estate. Once I wrapped my head around the concept, felt comfortable enough to make my first investment into 108 apartments in San Antonio. That was in September of 2021. I started seeing the cash flow come in as a passive investor and I saw the tax benefits too. And it was really a proof of concept moment for me where I thought to myself, hey, if I'm gonna do this for my own wealth, I might as well do it for my friends, my family, anyone else who's interested in coming along for the ride because what fun is it to be financially free, you know, on the beach all alone? Might as well have the people you care about there with you. So I started my company, Clive Capital, in January of 2022. And I guess that was really the moment where I realized, hey, I'm going to be building this wealth for myself, find these investment opportunities. I should help other people on the same path because truthfully, I wish someone else had helped me or helped my parents, my family make those same investments earlier on in their career rather than relying just on the stock market. And so since January, 2022, we've helped investors invest into over a thousand apartments and over the development of over 500 single family homes. Really our goal is to build a diversified portfolio for our investors that focuses, I would say balances out a couple of things. So appreciation, cash flow, tax benefits, the risk to reward, and then liquidity. So really building our investment portfolio around, you know, optimizing some balance between those five factors with the ultimate goal being to help our investors build generational wealth, achieve financial freedom for themselves and their families and those they care about. Wonderful. So the the private money that you have raised, uh, when did you start raising that? I started raising, I think my first investor, you know, wired me capital January 2022, right? As we all remember, interest rates started hiking up and up and up. I got Great time you. to I got get you. to the business. Right. So uh, what are your favorite ways to raise uh, private money? Um, I'm sure you have tried more than one thing on the raising of private money. What's your favorite ways to do it? I would say really it's to the day friends and family. I haven't really tapped out of friends and family just yet because I'm fortunate enough to be working in the tech industry where a lot of people, uh, a lot of people that I've worked with that I've become friends with now, they do pretty well for themselves. And then they have other contacts, other family members who are also doing well for themselves. So I would say number one is friends and family, but if you're fortunate enough to cross that barrier, you know, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars that you've raised, then at that point, I would really say social media, putting out content like the podcast here that you have going and the podcast that I have investing for generational wealth, you know, reaching out to people on LinkedIn, just telling people what you're doing and then asking them like, Hey, who do you know who's interested in it? and diversifying outside the stock market, achieving superior risk adjusted returns, tax benefits, et cetera. Sure. And so when you're having a <clears throat> conversation with a potential private lender, um, how do you like uh, to start a conversation or uh, even a approach the subject? Yeah, usually for me, you know, I start off the call, my intro calls with potential investors are always 30 minutes. I tell them, hey, you know, this is a 30 minute call. I'm happy to have hop on a follow up one. But on this call, I'd love to get to know you, what your career background is and has been so far. What your experiences in investing? Are you just in the stock market? Have you bought a few homes? Have you done private equity syndications before? And then lastly, what are your financial goals? Right. Are you the kind of person who is OK with partnering other people? and lending them your capital and if you're not then you know we might not be a good fit if you are then why are you investing is it because you want financial freedom is it really just to put numbers up on a scoreboard is it to get back to your family and spend more time with them 
and what what are you looking for from your investments? Are you looking for tax benefits, right? One of the factors that we mentioned earlier. Are you looking for tax benefits? Are you looking for high growth? So once I get a feel for what someone's experience has been so far and what they're looking for in their future investments, I can kind of cater the conversation to their needs. Well, what I love uh, about what you just explained, what I love is that, you know, the, the way I raise private money, I've never asked anybody for money, right? I, 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 I put on my teacher hat, right? People see my teacher hat all the time. And, and I teach people what private money is. In fact, the, the 47 private lenders that I have, um, the, the, I mean, none of them had ever even actually heard of private money or private lending until I put on my teacher hat and I taught them what it is, right? And so it's really all about getting your mindset straight first, leading with a servant's heart and not trying to talk anybody into anything or sell anybody anything. So what I love about what you just explained, uh, Keshav, is you're finding out what their needs are, you know, what their interests are as well. So I love the way you just explained you start out the conversation. Yeah, exactly. I think it really has to be tailored, figuring out what they need. And then if what you offer is what they're looking for, then great. And if not, that's totally fine. Maybe they know someone else, you know, who is looking for what you're offering. But really being up front about, hey, here's who we, here's what we do is who we work with and making sure that it's a good fit uh, is really paramount. And exactly. once we do that. So I'm going to ask you a question. I definitely know what my answer is. I'm interested in hearing your answer to this question. You know, a lot of people out there investing, the only thing they know to do is to invest in the stock market. I mean, you know, that's what their family did. That's what they do. Um, why should someone invest outside the stock market? Yeah, I could go on forever, but that, that's why we're talking here. So I would say that there's a handful of factors between five to eight, if I remember, you know, when I was putting the together uh, ebook i would say one you know is projected superior risk adjusted returns projected because not, no one's making any promises here um, and risk adjusted meaning we all know the phrase risk it for the biscuit the higher the risk the higher the reward but do you want to take a small amount of risk and may you know 10x your returns, or do you want to take a lot more risk, 100x more risk, and 20x your returns, right? There's an optimal ratio where you get the most bang for your buck. So I would say that's one, right? For taking on additional risk, the return projected returns are superior. Two, and when you're investing outside the stock market. Two, I would say, is the tax benefit. In the stock market, you have short-term capital gains and long-term capital gains, right? You don't get the depreciation losses. You don't get to take the expenses as deductions because you're not an investor directly in the company when you're in the stock market. You're investing into a C-corp structure. When you invest outside the stock market, a lot of times you'll be investing, you'll be an owner into an LLC, like you'll have ownership. And so the expenses, the deductions pass through to you as an owner of that LLC. Besides that, I would say volatility is a big thing in the stock market. You know, last Monday, I believe we saw the stock market. I, it was a single digit, it was a single digit drop. It was nothing crazy, but that kind of volatility day in and day out is not something that I would like to go through the rest of my life. You know, just because a war breaks out in another country or another country is going through some sort of political turmoil, that isn't going to as much affect real estate values here. But on the other hand, the slightest hint of uncertainty of, you know, military conflict or political tension in another country and the stock market will drop a few points. I didn't like that either. And I would say... Lastly, not lastly even, but it's more of a playing level playing field, in my opinion, when it comes to these alternative investments outside the stock market. 
when I'm in the stock market sitting on my happy eight to 10% returns per year, I know other people out there are making way more than the eight to 10% that I'm making. There are politicians making more than eight to 10% per year. There are hedge funds making more than eight to 10% per year. And I just can't compete with these people. I don't have the power, political power. I don't have, you know, computers, algorithms, giving me trades at nanoseconds. So it's an unlevel playing field. But in these alternative investments, in my opinion, at least, it's more of a playing field, level playing field. You don't have, you know, computers crunching out algorithms to figure out, to instantly trade on values of real estate or, you know, things like that. Yeah. In addition to what you just said, uh, the biggest reason that I like real estate over uh, stocks is that most people that are investing in stocks and mutual funds, they don't even understand what they're investing in, right? I mean, they are listening supposedly to a trusted advisor and they're just doing what the advisor, you know, tells them to do in this world of real estate. It's something that I can understand. Right. And also, um, it gets rid of the volatility, right? Um, most of the real estate that I do in single family houses are flips. So I'm going to be in and out of a property before I'm going to have to worry about any volatility in, uh, in values. Uh, I just invested in an oceanfront condominium a few weeks ago, and I was in and out in five weeks from purchase until sale. And my net net profit after realtor fees was $160,000. And I could see, you know, what was going to be happening uh, in less than six weeks. Now, of course, as you know, and I know, investing is cyclical, uh, no matter what you're in. And the commercial apartment cycle has sort of peaked and actually it's sort of falling in some markets. So what is your, what's your comment on that? Yeah, that's definitely a great question. And I'll start that off with all investments come with risk, right? That's something that you as an investor should be able to go to sleep at night with knowing that being said, that's not an excuse to underperform on your investments or have someone else underperform on your investments on your behalf either when you're investing in, this private investment world. So cycles happen in every asset class in the stock market. Prices come up, prices come down, right? Real estate, that's the same, you know, interest rates come up and down. If you're doing private lending, any business that you buy, there's going to be ebbs and flows, right? Booms and busts, growth periods and recessions. I would say to mitigate against that one, you have to really, pick the right people to invest with. I would say that's the number one most important thing when you're investing outside of the stock market because you're trusting your money with this person who is promising you, not promising you, but projecting a return for you. Whether it's private lending, whether you're investing into an apartment building, they're telling you, hey, you put your hard-earned money with us and we will grow it by doing X, Y, Z. You have to make sure that you're partnering with the right people to maximize the probability that, you know, you will grow your money at the rate that you originally projected. Because a lot of people, some people are flat out fraudulent. They will take your money and they might run. And it's unfortunate that that happens, but that happens. And then second, even if they have good intentions and they're not fraudulent, they might not know what they're doing. And in cases like this, where a lot of people got into this private equity syndication space over the last three, four years, even though they had good intentions, they might still lose your money because they don't have experience. They just bought a coaching program or something, put a pitch deck together, raised some capital from friends and family, and it went south because interest were low back then and anyone could do great deals. Now interest rates are higher and it actually takes execution and experience to manage these businesses and execute on the business plans that they projected. That's one, finding the right team. And two, I'd say is don't invest anything that you aren't willing to lose. I'm not saying you should go into investment expecting to lose. Don't invest your last dollar with anyone. It's not going to be good for you, your family or the person you invested with. Everyone's just gonna be stressed. So always keep some reserves with you. 
And then third is diversification. You know, apartments, real estate is a very local, is, you know, a pretty local asset class. Just because, you know, rents are coming down in Houston, for example, doesn't necessarily mean rents are coming down in Phoenix. They are coming down in Phoenix, let's say North Dakota, right? Just because the rental market's coming down in Houston doesn't mean it's coming down in North Dakota. So diversify the apartment buildings that you're buying across multiple real estate markets. Diversify asset classes too. Don't just invest in apartment buildings. Invest into industrial warehouses. Invest into private lending, you know, which Jay is a big fan of. Invest into oil and gas. And that's really why I founded my company is I don't want to just invest into apartment buildings. I don't want that for my investors either. I want to bring them a buffet of investment options that's diversified across the team that we're investing with, the asset class, the business plan, and the geographic location. So when you have it spread out and you're mitigating these different factors, that's a good way to hedge against any potential market downfall. That being said, it's market downfalls are just a part of investing and you have to have the patience as an investor to ride it out. Very wise advice, very wise advice. So given the climate of the market going on right now, um, what kind of trends do you see uh, coming down the pike in the near future? And of course, as you just mentioned, that may, that may, be, that may depend on the market, right? Yeah, but I, but let me well let me be more specific with with my question. What do you see happening in the market that might convince someone that alter that an alternative asset class like we're talking about, you know, really does add up and make sense for them to strongly consider? Yeah, I somewhere I I'll start this off by saying I wish I read more news uh, to be more educated on this, but. I read that the uh, stock market is being increasingly weighted towards the tech stocks, the big seven. There's the concentration of that as a percentage of total market volume cap is increasing. So everyone who's investing into index funds and mutual funds and all that, all of their eggs are going into the same seven baskets and that is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's just, that's driving the growth really. In, in the stock market. And it's doing pretty well. You know, what I would say is if someone's in the stock market right now, the stock market has been doing pretty well. Real estate is actually coming down because some people are, the apartment buildings are being foreclosed on uh, due to them not being able to pay their loans. There's a lot of supply coming on the market too. And cap rates have expanded over the last two years, I would say. A good move could be to take some of those wins from the stock market and put them into real estate, right? Now, you can do that through cash by just outright selling the stocks and investing. You could also do that through a self-directed IRA. A lot of us have 401ks, Roth IRAs from previous companies or current companies. What you can do is roll a portion of that over into a self-directed IRA and gain a lot of the same tax benefits that come with a normal 401k or Roth IRA, but now you can use that self-directed IRA to invest into these private opportunities. You can lend out of that side. You can lend from that SD IRA. You can invest in the syndications from that self-directed IRA. So that's one, I would say take some chips off the table if in the stock market. And two, real estate is always a great investment for the most part. I might even say always. Because right now we're short a couple million homes, units as a nation, and that gap isn't being closed anytime soon. We've seen housing prices hold pretty steady across the nation, even though interest rates came up. And if rates come down, people might think that's a great time to buy, but that's just going to send the prices through the roof again. And with single family housing becoming, unfortunately, increasingly unaffordable for most Americans, they're gonna to have to rent somewhere to live. Even right now, renting is about 600 to $800 cheaper per month than it is to buy a home. 
So invest in the apartment building rental market. That's people going to need a place to stay. Make sure your market has sound fundamentals, but that is a great place. That, like right now with interest rates where they are, uh, private lending, private credit is something that I like a lot as well. I'm also exploring other asset classes. I'm exploring uh, oil and gas, bringing that to my investors just because of our energy needs as a society, as a civilization, and how it's growing. I'm exploring investing into industrial warehouses because of a lot of manufacturing and how it's coming back from overseas back to North America, to Mexico, to the US. So those are some of the bets that I'm making and what I'm seeing. And like how I plan on having these next few years. Mm. Yeah. All right. So you know, someone could, um, they could go to one of the big houses, Vanguard, Charles Schwab, whatever they could, you know, go there, open up an account. They could invest in a mutual fund, for example, that, you know, in turn invest in oil and gas. So, uh, of course you've got your fund Clive capital. Why should someone seriously consider investing with you instead of doing what so many other people do, what I said <laughs> earlier, they don't even understand what they're investing in. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's a great question. And it really comes down to I would, the tax treatment uh, portion of it. And yeah, so, you know, when let's say Exxon goes out and drills for oil, you're investing into Exxon, they are a C Corp. And because you don't have direct ownership in the C Corp, you don't get the tax benefits that comes with drilling for oil you don't get to take advantage of a lot of the expenses uh, that can be passed down either. There's that financial aspect of it. So in the syndications that we put together, you directly invest into the LLC. You are an investor in the LLC. And because of that, when the LLC gets profits, when it gets expenses, when it gets tax benefits, because you're a direct owner in the LLC, those pass directly to you. You don't directly own the C Corp, you own shares in the C Corp. That's the best way that I can explain it. Uh, so, you know, those expenses, those tax benefits don't necessarily flow through to you. On top of that, the financial aspect of it, you know, our syndications, our private equity offerings, we project, I'm not promising anything, I legally can't promise anything, we project higher returns. You know, because there isn't the, for a lot of factors, but one of the big things is there isn't that corporate blow. You know, we can be nimble and these are smaller operations. You're not just investing into a big giant like Exxon. Which brings me to my third point. When you make these smaller investments with people that you know, you are not just a name on a screen, if, if even that, you know, the CEO of Exxon does not know who you are when you're investing. But when you invest with a professional investor like myself or Jay or our colleagues, we know you, we know your name, we know your kids, you know, your pets, your financial situation, etc. We can tailor fit our investment portfolio, our opportunities to you, and we can be more transparent with you about why your investment is performing the way that it's performing. If Exxon stock goes down, you can read about it on the news about why it went down, but you can't call up the CEO of Exxon and say, hey, why is my stock down? Why is my investment down? Or where do you see it going the next few months? With us, we provide you a greater level of transparency where you can see, hey, here's the expenses that came in. Here's the profit that came in. Here's what's going on in my investment on a monthly basis. And you can learn from investing with us where we will tell you, here's why your returns are decreasing or increasing. So you're more in the know when you invest in these smaller opportunities and they tend to pay out projected a lot better than stock market returns. And you know what you just went over, <clears throat> um, Keshav, is your investors, like my private lenders, they're really not investing in the deals per se. What they're really investing in is you. That's what they're investing in. That's where they're putting their trust. And you just laid out many, many reasons as to why 
uh, someone would want to invest with you um, is because the transparency and, and they, I mean, you they can see exactly what's going on. And I love your analogy of they're not going to be able to pick up the telephone and talk to the CEO of Exxon, right? But they're going to be they're going to be able to talk to Keshav. Keshav, I know we've got uh, folks that are listening in that would love to have a conversation with you. Would love to further the conversation. What is the best way that they can reach out to you? Learn more about uh, Clive Capital. Yeah. My LinkedIn is the best way to reach out to me. My name, Keshav Kolor, uh, right here, the URL that's linked. Luckily, unique name. So it's hard to find, but once you find it, I'm the only one out there. So LinkedIn's a good way to reach out to me. Uh, my Facebook page, following me there. And I would say, what else? Our YouTube, we also host a weekly podcast and we upload the episodes to YouTube and all the other major podcasting platforms on topics like this. It's regarding building generational wealth and cover topics from taxes to investments to, you know, asset protection, things like that. And lastly, I would say check out our website. We have a lead magnet for you guys, educational resource, clivecap.com forward slash alternative dash assets. We include a due diligence checklist of about 100 questions. The questions you should ask when you're investing with someone outside the stock market, because like Jay and I have been talking about, they are your make or break regarding whether your investment works out or not. So you want to know who you're investing with more importantly than what are you investing in? So it's a hundred questions to make sure you're investing with the right person. We also have a two pager about why you should invest as a stock market covering some of the reasons that I discussed here. And then if you're interested and you have the attention span for it and the interest, then we also have an ebook, which is just a longer version of the two pager. Uh, the ebook's probably like 25 minute read, 20 minute read. And the two pager is like a five, 10 minute read about why she'd be investing outside the stock market. Perfect. Well, for those that are listening, of course, all the contact information is going to be in the show notes, but for, um, Keshav's, uh, name, like at LinkedIn, Facebook, and et cetera, that's all one word. And you spell his name K E S H A V K O L U R again, that's K E S H A V K O L U R. Keshav, what a wealth of information. Thank you so much for sharing. You dropped a lot of gold nuggets. And thank you so much for taking the time to join us here on the show. It was an honor, Jay. I appreciate you having me on. And uh, thank you for those listening at home. Absolutely. And gratitude as well. Thank you for listening and, and uh, tuning into the show. If you uh, have found this valuable and insightful, uh, if you're on listening to any of the podcast platforms, uh, be sure to uh, follow me. Be sure to like, and we love reviews. If you happen to be watching on YouTube, be sure to click that bell, subscribe, and click the bell so you don't miss out. I'm Jay Connor, the Private Money Authority, wishing you all the best, and I'm looking forward to seeing you right here on the next episode of Raising Private Money. Are you feeling inspired by the knowledge you gained in this episode? Then head over to jconner.com slash money guide. That's jconner.com slash money guide and download your free guide that shares seven reasons why private money will skyrocket your real estate investing business right now. Again, that's jconner.com slash money guide to get your free guide. We'll see you next time on Raising Private Money with Jay Conner.